from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome. This is a very special occasion for we are launching our fourth year of this series for African poets and writers. And I just want to take uh, a minute to talk to you about the partners to this series and our overall objective um, before we, to, we get to the main part of our program. You know, the Library of Congress, in partnership with the Africa Society and the National Summit on Africa and the Poetry and Literature Center at the Library of Congress, decided that we wanted to showcase the immense talent of African authors and to create a repository for their work, which would, be, remain, which would remain here um, for a very long time. And the people who we've managed to bring here uh, to address audiences, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, before launching the series, we had the privilege of having Chinua Achebe. And the series was launched by a board member of the Africa Society's Professor Ali Mazuri. Neither of them are with us now. But as we go forward with new artists, I feel as though they are among us and that what they've begun is a very important work which we hope to continue for a very long time. So this is organized by the African Session of the Af African and Middle Eastern Division in collaboration, as I said earlier, with the Poetry and Literature uh, uh, Center. And this literary series consists of interviews, which you'll see, with established and emerging, emerging poets, short story writers, novelists, and playwrights from uh, continental and uh, diasporic Africa. The African and Middle Eastern Division is the library's center for the study of some 78 countries and regions from southern Africa to the Maghreb and from the Middle East to Central Asia. And I have to say right here that it's just an honor to work with the people who have worked on this series, people like Dr. Mary Jane Deeb and Dr. Angel Batiste and Eve Ferguson and our uh, partners there who are all of whom are instrumental in this series being a success. The Poetry and Literature uh, Center at the Library of Congress fosters and enhances the public's appreciation of literature. The head of that division is en route here and is presently stuck on a train uh, in Baltimore and will be here so you'll have a chance to meet him. And now I would just like to tell you, just want to tell you something about the Africa Society. The mission of the Africa Society is to educate Americans about the diverse cultures, histories, and economies of the countries comprising the continent of Africa. And we do this through a series of uh, programs targeted to young people, Teach Africa program, where we've reached over 10,000 students, to the Ambassador Andrew Young Lecture Series, to films that we've done with the Travel Channel with African heads of state that in the past have reached 200 million viewers per segment worldwide. So I, I'm proud to also tell you today that we have a distinguished author in our midst who's in the audience, Marita Golden, welcome. She is a native of Washington, D.C., and uh, we hope one day, Marita, we'll hear more from you in, in our series, in your work. But our guest speaker today, you know, it's, it's fitting that the person to launch the fourth year of our series is a Nigerian-American. Her name is Chinelo Okporanta, and you know, um, <laughs> That Nigeria is one of the powerhouses of Africa and Africa's most populous country. There is no end to the contributions that Nigerians have made to the United States and to the world. Uh, to Chinelo, I have to say that your, uh, the, your, your, the title of your sh collection of short stories, Happiness, 
like water. Happiness is something that we all need to sustain us like water. And your being here today, I want you to know, um, evokes a lot of emotion in us and happiness being one of those emotions. You look like your pictures and you look too young to have accomplished all you have. But to give our audience greater information about who you are, the honors accorded you, I will introduce Dr. Mary Jane Deep. Dr. Deep. Thank you, thank you Bernadette. And uh, thank you all for being here. I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the African Middle East Division. So I'm delighted to see you all in our, in our reading room. And um, I just want to say uh, a few words, but Bernadette has already mentioned that we're responsible for 78 countries. We have three sections, uh, the African section, the Near East section, and the Hebraic section. And each of them organizes programs, conferences, exhibits related to its collections and its regional responsibility and expertise. Today, the African section and uh, we have members, Eve Ferguson, uh, Dr. Adrian Batiste, Marita Harper, and uh, Laverne Page, who's not here, um, comprise the core of our African section. And uh, they've been very active in promoting and in organizing uh, this series on conversations with African poets and writers. So today, in partnership with uh, Bernadette Paolo, the CEO and President of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa and the Poetry Center here at the library. And as was mentioned, Rob is on his way, Rob Casper, who's the head of the program and will be joining us soon. Uh, we are launching the 19th in our series, the 19th conversation with African poets and writers. So it's quite an accomplishment. Um, and we're very proud of it. This videotape series is meant to record for posterity the words and images of important African authors. In addition to their works, which the Library of Congress holds, teachers, scholars, students, and others interested in African culture will have a unique primary source of reference for their research and an additional teaching tool to educate youngsters about Africa namely an entire archive of African authors explaining in their own words the importance of their literary work and that of their colleagues to better understand African culture and society. So now it's my, my, my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Chinelo Okparanta, who will be interviewed by Dr. Angel Batiste, the Africa area specialist responsible for uh, Nigeria, among other countries in this division and a published scholar in her own right. So, Chinelo Oparanta was born in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. She received her BS from Pennsylvania State University, her MA from Rutgers University, and her MFA from Iowa Writers' Workshop, where she served as a provost postgraduate visiting writer. She's the author of America, shortlisted for the 2013 Kane Prize for African Writing. Her collection of short stories, Happiness Like Water, published last year by Mariner Books, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, was long listed for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award and short listed for the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award. It received the Lambda Literary Award in the Lesbian General Fiction category. The collection was also a New York Times Sunday Book Review Editor's Choice. A review in the Times concludes by turning to Ada, the narrator of Ran's Girl, who notes the silences that fall between her and her mother as if we no longer valued spoken words, as if spoken words were gaudy finishes on a delicate piece of art, unnecessary distractions from the master's piece whose substance was more meaningfully experienced if left unornamented. Unorm if this is Oparanta's goal, the distillation of experience into something crystalline, stark, but lustrous. She's well on her way there. Okparanta's debut novel, Under the Udala Trees, will be published by Harcourt Houghton Mifflin um, in September. So um, please join me in welcoming her here. And um, 
and Dr. Angel Batiste will uh, carry out the interview. So, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for being here. So, the first, the first excerpt I will read is from the first story in the collection called Onohato Street. I write a lot about uh, men and their wives, uh, relationships, and so this story is about a relationship. The evening the robbers came, Chiwe and Eze had attended the Kingdom Hall. She had not fallen asleep, so Eze had not scolded her afterwards. But the story goes that when they returned home, she went into work in the kitchen with the house girls to prepare dinner. For one reason or another, the meal had turned out too spicy. There was the hot scent of crushed peppers in the air throughout the bungalow. And when she and Eze sat down to eat, their tongues seed from the heat of the peppers. That gave Eze all the reason he needed to be cross with her. That night, the night of the robbery, Chiwe fell asleep in a sad state, still smarting from Eze's scolding. She fell asleep to the sound of the floor fan, which stood at the corner of the room, humming softly with each oscillation like a lullaby. Usually, she opened their bedroom windows halfway at night, and as she fell asleep, she listened to the sounds of the guava and plantain trees just outside, their leaves rustling in the breeze. But that night, the air was still, and with the scent of crushed peppers strong in the air, traveling down their nostrils and into their throats, causing them all to cough dryly, something had to be done. It followed that Chiwe turned on the fan and opened the windows all the way. Also, she left the door to their room open, the door that led to the corridor. She awoke to the sound of shattering glass and to the sight of two men entering the room. The room was dark, but owing to the moonlight, which crept in through the open windows, she could see that the men were masked. There was a metal safe that Eze kept in the, bath in the bottom shelf of the bedside table. One of the men went straight to the safe, picked it up, pointed the gun at Eze, ordered him to open up the safe. Of course, Eze refused. The man held the gun even closer to Eze's head. There was a clicking sound. Chima screamed, begging the man to stop. The second man, who had until then been lingering at the doorway, made his way to her side. She could not see the look on his face owing to the mask that he wore, but it must have been sympathetic because he tapped her on the shoulder and told her not to worry that everything would be fine if she would only open the safe for him. So she grabbed the safe from Eze, dialed the combination and opened it up herself. She spilled its contents onto the white, white bedding, tangled up necklaces of gold, rings whose jewels shone in the dark. And then of course there were the wads and wads of Naira bills which the men stuck into the bags that hung from their shoulders. Good work, the second man said, patting her on the shoulder when he was done bagging the items. But still, his gun found its way behind her head. So that night, the robbers hold their guns behind Chima and Eze's heads and lead them out into the corridor. Chima watches as Eze struggles with his robber, refusing to move so that the man has to shove him forward. She knows that the house girls are in the quarters at the back of the house. She wills them to appear, to somehow appear and scare the robbers away. She wills them to hear, but it doesn't seem that they hear a thing. Chima and Eze stand quietly in the corridor for a while, Chima listening to the sound of the oscillating fan. Even though it is a distance away, its sound is loud because of course everything is quiet now. After the silence, the robber holding the gun to Eze's head says, that car outside, the white one, I'll be needing the keys. Eze has a look of horror on his face, as if he's just seen death, which is funny because until then, he's been acting all bold, courageous, resisting. The keys, the man repeats, and actually we'll also be needing you to come out and start it for us. One can only imagine the emotions Eze must have been feeling inside because that car was his prized possession. 
Every once in a while, before the robbery that is, he'd taken to reminding Chime that it was the only one of its kind in the whole of River State, that there were only two of them in the whole of Nigeria, the other owner being a big man, a governor of one of the other states. In any case, the robber has to drag Eze again in order to get him to move, smacking his head every so often with the gun. Start the car and no wahala for you. Don't start the car and we will shoot. Chima and Eze managed to make eye contact somewhere in the middle of all the dragging and head smacking. Chima looks at Eze with pleasing eyes, pleading eyes. Just give them the car. Give them the car and spare our lives. But the more she looks at him, the more defeat she feels, because she knows that she is no match for the car. So she stands there watching the man drag Eze outside, and she remains inside with the second robber still pointing his gun at her. But even if she is inside, she knows what things are like outside, the ground paved with gravel and grass, and the bush near where the 505 is parked, green, saturated with the red of the hibiscus flowers. She and Eze stood in front of that bush for a picture on the day that Eze bought home, brought home the 505 SRS. It was her mama who took the picture. Here and there, lizards were crawling over the gravel stones. As she stands there with the robber holding a gun to her head, she remembers her mama holding the camera, taking a picture of her and Eze and of the car. And somehow she thinks of the wedding game she used to play with her papa. Suddenly, she imagines that if the camera could have spoken the day her mama took the picture, it would have said something like this. The step which you are about to take is the most important into which you will come. Do you take this car to be your wedded wife as long as you both shall live? And as they would nod ecstatically at the camera, and he would fervently say, I do. And that answer would be correct. In any case, the way she tells the story, some more time passes, quiet time, and Chiwe allows herself to get lost in her thoughts. She moves on from the memory of the wedding game and she remembers that the police station is not too far down the street. She starts to think that maybe one of the police officers will somehow see or hear something. She also thinks of Ehoro the estate's owner. She remembers that he had begun carrying a gun the moment the threat of the robbers became real, around the time that they held the anti-robbery collection meeting. She becomes hopeful that someone, either a real police officer or a hero himself, will come to the rescue. She hears the gunshot then. She shrieks as if the bullet had been fired at her, as if it were piercing her own body. The story goes that after the robber leaves Eze to the 505 SRS, somehow the man gets Eze to produce the key. The man opens the door, asks Eze to enter and to start the car. Eze gets in, puts the key into the ignition, but the car refuses to start. The man asks him to try again. Eze turns the key in the ignition, the engine makes a squeaking sound, but it still does not start. Meanwhile, as it holds his hand up in the air, at the sides of his face, shakes his head, continues to shake it, as if he does not know why the car won't start. The man pulls Eze out of the car, drags him to the Land Rover, which is on the other side of the front yard. He believes that Eze is purposefully doing something to prevent the car from starting, and he is right. In any case, when he's dragged Eze to the Land Rover, he asks Eze to raise his hands over his head all the way up as if Eze himself is the criminal, as if he is under arrest. The man steps back so that there is some distance between him and Eze, then he aims the gun at Eze. Maybe he is just about to fire when he hears the gunshot. Maybe he has no intention of firing at all, just a little something to scare Eze into starting the car. Whatever the case, Eze's robber hears the gunshot too, and suddenly, he is on the tips of his toes, running away with his gun across the front yard, even jumping over the glass-lined gate of the estate to escape. At least, this is how Eze told the story of what happened outside. Inside, after they hear the shot, the robber who is holding the gun to Eze's head lowers the gun. He appears confused, puzzled. Then he turns to the door 
that leads to the garage and out the driveway, and he runs off too. There is something, there's some screaming outside and the sound of racing feet, but Chinua stays inside and just waits, too stunned even to know what she is waiting for. Not very long after, Mr. Ehoro enters the corridor with Eze by his side. There is sweat dripping from Ehoro's forehead and he wipes it with the back of his hand. There is sweat also dripping from Eze's forehead, but Chinue pays that in mind. Instead, she looks for the blood on Eze's chest, but there is none. Eze starts to tell the story of what happened outside, how he refused to start the car but not, by not pressing one of the buttons he should have pressed. He laughs at his cleverness. He winks at Chinue, a self-congratulatory wink, as if to say, aren't I something? It is now Friday, and Eze laments that, this, that it is not Thursday all over again, or Saturday, or Sunday, so that he can tell the story at once to the entire congregation at the Kingdom Hall. For now, his imagination will have to do, and so he imagines breaking the news, and he anticipates what their reaction will be, gratitude to Jehovah for the miracle. Chima listens to him for some time, Ehoro stands by Eze's side listening too. Sometimes he laughs at the things Eze says. I'm leaving, Chima says, numbly. It comes out as a whisper, and Eze continues to speak because he doesn't hear her. She turns around and heads for the bedroom. The fan is still oscillating and the metal safe lies open on their bed, empty. She moves it aside gently. She goes to her wardrobe, op opens it, takes out a large suitcase from its bottom shelf. She removes a few of her clothes from their hangers, folds them one by one and puts them into the suitcase. She is still folding the items when she hears the sound of Eze's footsteps approaching. She sits on the bed by the open suitcase and waits for him to walk into the room. As she waits, she imagines that he is already inside the room, that he has made his way to her in the still dark room. She imagines that he wrinkles his forehead like a question and he reaches out with his arms to stop her from what she is doing. She imagines him telling her that she will break her mother's heart by leaving him, telling her that even her mother would want to know the meaning of all this. Of course he would be right. She imagines that he runs off to find his new world translation and that he returns with it and he reads from it to her about marriage, about God's disapprobation of divorce. She even imagines him asking her how she expects to survive without a job, without any income. A grown woman like you, living off your mama, she imagines him telling her. When he asks it, she does not bother to respond. Instead, she thinks of herself back at her teaching job that old teaching job, and she thinks how grateful she will be to be back. In her imagination, Eze continues to chide, but she continues to pack her bag. When it is all packed, she lifts it from the bed and only pauses to say goodbye. She sits there and imagines all this, and she waits. But it is a long while before he enters the room, and an even longer time before she musters the courage to zip up the suitcase and leave. So the next, thank you. So the next excerpt I'll read is from my story, Runs Girl. And that is a story set in Nigeria. And it's, you know, I write a lot about mothers and daughters. And so this story is about a mother and daughter relationship. Um, the mother falls ill and the daughter has to figure out a way to take care of her mother. Um, I'm just going to read the beginning. The year Mama fell sick was the year Njideka confessed to me that she was a runs girl. I should have known. She walked around campus with shiny silk blouses hanging low on her shoulders, her stilettos making tiny dents in the earth. That year, the runs girls began to circulate the University of Port Harcourt campus. Or maybe they'd always been around. Maybe I only noticed them that year with their expensive outfits and accessories, money written all over their bodies because Mama was falling apart and there was almost nothing I could do. 
A bird had flown over our compound with a mouse in its mouth. A black bird, maybe a crow. From the parlor window, we watched it fly. It was lovely and surreal like a painting. Beautiful blue skies as the backdrop to blackness and death. The bird dropped the mouse on the ground within a few steps of our front door. We found it that evening just before sunset. Its tail was twisted around its body, its pelt already stiff. That evening, Mama snapped a branch of the guava tree in our, in our backyard. She used the branch to pick up the mouse and to stick it in a plastic bag. I took the bag with me across the street to the garbage dump there. I tossed the bag into the sea of trash. Hours later, Mama began to feel sick. If Papa had still been alive, he would have chanted his usual saying, the witch cried yesterday, the child died today. Who does not know the cause of the child's death? But the doctors did not know, and even if they had known, chances are their diagnosis would have had nothing to do with the bird and the mouse. They were scientists, after all, not superstitious like the rest of us. It began with pain on the shoulder. Mama decided that for dinner we would have some goat meat in pepper soup with more than the usual amount of upazi leaves. The leaves made the soup bitter. Mama said that the bitterness in combination with the pepper would chase the pain away. But the next day she could barely move her left arm. We should have gone to the hospital straight away, but Mama said to hold off. They would charge us 2,000 naira just to see the doctor. That was the amount they charged the last time we went when Mama was having all those sweats followed immediately by chills. That time, the doctors ran their tests and told her she was fine. 2,000 naira wasted, nothing fixed. There was no telling that the doctors would solve the problem this time. Besides, Mama was certain it was the curse of the blackbird. Nothing a little praying and Bible reading couldn't fix, she said. So that second evening, we read the Bible together more fervently than ever. Nepa had once again taken light but there was still a little glow from the sun coming in through the windows of our parlor. We knelt on the tile floor, our bodies resting on the seat of the couch. Happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty, for he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yes, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. Mama's voice shook as she read, and the mosquitoes flew about the room making soft whistling sounds near our ears. Suddenly, Mama was no longer reading and I was looking up to find her swatting the area around her head. And then she let out a piercing shriek, a sound I hope I never hear again for as long as I live. When night finally came, Mama's moaning had still not stopped. Hours passed, but there was no sleep for her and no sleep for me. The pain was somewhere in her torso, she said, on the left side, between the upper shoulder and the lower back. She could feel it also in her front, just as she would expect a heart attack to feel, except there was no indication that her heart was the part in which the crumbling was taking place. It seemed the heart would be just fine, she said, yet I observed the signs. All of them were far from promising. In the end, it was I who forced her to go to the hospital. We walked out the door early the next morning, taking small steps, my hands fastened securely around her waist. Slower, Ada, Mama said. I tightened my grip on her. Ndo, I said, sorry. And the final excerpt I will read is from my story, Fairness, also a story in the collection. And fairness is about beauty. And beauty, as we all know, is an important topic. And not just physical beauty, but also inner beauty. Um, and this story tackles both. There's a way in which when we first read the story, we think of you know, children obsessed with physical beauty, but we also look at the story and we see the, way, the ways in which 
we teach children to be obsessed with physical beauty, but also in a way that damages their inner beauty. And so it's a sort of story like that. Um, it also deals a lot with social hierarchies, although people don't usually, don't usually see that when they look at the story. It's kind of a gruesome story, so you can't help but focus on the, the cruel aspects of it, I guess. In any case, here we go. Inside the bathroom, the air is humid and smells clean, purified, a chemical kind of fresh. There is no lock on the door, but we make sure to close it behind us. Enna holds the towel and stands back, but I call her to me because I am again finding myself skeptical of the water and of the bleach. In my imagination, I see Clara's suspicious eyes and I hear Boma's disbelieving laugh. Fear catches me and I think perhaps we should not bother. Perhaps we should just pour everything out. But then I hear Mama's voice saying, foolish Eno, dummy Eno. I take the towel from Eno. You should go first, I say. It is a deceitful reason that I give, but it is also true. Because you're not supposed to be here. That way, you'll be already done by the time anyone comes to chase you out. Enna nods. She concedes straight away. She gets on her knees, bends her body over the wall of the bathtub so that her upper half hangs horizontally above the tub so that her face is just above the bucket. We'll do the face today, I say. Dip it in until you feel something like a tingle. She dips her face into the water. She stays that way for some time, holding her breath. Even if I'm not the one with my face submerged, it is hard for me to breathe. Anna lifts up her head. My back is starting to ache and I don't feel anything. You have to do it for longer, I say. Stand up, stretch your back, but you have to try to stay longer. Anna stands up. She lifts her hands above her head in a stretch. She gets back down on her knees, places her face into the bucket again. Only get up when you feel the tingling, I say. Time passes. Do you feel it yet? The back of Enel's head moves from side to side, a shake with her face still in the water. More time passes. Not yet. The back of Enel's head moves again from side to side. Okay, come up. She lifts her face from the water first. She stands up. The color of her skin seems softer to the eyes, just a little lighter than before. I smile at her. It's working, I say, but we need to go full force. Okay, she says. Good. She watches as I pour the liquid from the bucket into the tub. We both watch as the water drains. We listen as it gurgles down the pipe. I take the bucket out of the tub, place it in a corner of the bathroom by the sink. The bath bowl is sitting in the sink. I pick it up, hold it above the tub, pour the bleach straight into it. I get down on my knees, call Enna to my side, tell her to place, the, place her face into the bowl. She does. Only a little time passes and then she screams and her scream fills the bathroom, saturates every tiny bit of the room and I am dizzy with it. Then there is the thud and splash of the bowl in the tub. Then there is the thud of the door slamming into the wall, Ikaite rushes towards us, sees that it is Eno who is in pain. She reaches her hands out to Eno, holds Eno's face in her palms. Eno screams, twists her face, her cheek, her cheeks contort as if she is sucking in air. She screams and screams, I feel the pain in my own face. Ikaite looks as if she feels it too, and for a moment, I think I see tears forming in her eyes. Papa looms in the doorway, then enters the bathroom. He looks fiercely at me. He asks, what did you do to her? What did you do? In the doorway, I see Mama just watching, her eyes flicking this way and that. What did you do, Papa asks again. I turn to him pleading, wanting desperately to make my case, but I don't find the words. I turn to Mama. I beg her to explain. She looks blankly at me, a little confusion in her eyes. 
I stand in the middle of them, frozen with something like fear, something not quite guilt. By then, even Emmanuel has made his way into the house, abandoning his post at the gate. He stands just behind Mama and his peering eyes seem to ask me that same question. What did you do? My legs feel weak and I turn to Eno. I smile at her. I think of Mama and her creams. Don't worry, I say. We'll find something that works. Eno continues to scream. I blink my eyes as if to blink myself awake. Days later, when the scabs start to form, I imagine peeling them off like the hard shell of a velvet tamarind. Enos flesh underneath the scabs is the reddish yellow of the tamarind's pulp, not quite the yellow of a ripe pulp or peel. And even if I know that this scabby fairness of hers is born of injury, a temporary fairness of skinless flesh, patchy and ugly in its patchiness, I think how close she has come to having skin like Onyechi's, and I feel something like envy in me, because what she has wound up with is fairness after all, fairness if only for a while. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Tinelo. Thank you. I've been trying to pronounce her name correctly all morning, so I hope I'm getting close. Um, we thank you and we congratulate you on your debut collection, thank Happiness you. Like Water. I'd like to start our interview by asking uh, when did you actually start writing? Why did you turn to fiction in the short story format? Well, um, I might have written stories as a child, but I actually don't remember writing stories as a child. What I remember is my undergraduate uh, studies at Penn State University, and I remember that I, I took a few creative writing courses in English, but also when I thought about it, I took some courses in French as well. Um, I took, I, I had tested out of beginning and intermediate French courses and so I had to take advanced French courses in college and so I took some creative writing courses and I guess part of why I might have done that was because when you think of it, many, many African writers are Francophone writers mm -hmm. and so maybe my head was just thinking, oh, let's make an Anglophone Francophone <laughs> alliance or something. <laughs> And so I did write in French, little stories in French, and I, I recently moved, so I looked at those journals. And it's funny, sometimes, some of them I can't even remember what the meaning of some of the words I used. Um, but yeah, so, and also back as an undergraduate, I studied Francophone writers like Maria Maba, Kamar Halai, mm. M.S. Césaire, and such. And in any case, um, so that's what I remember. I also kept journals and diaries as a child, and so that might have been the beginning of me turning into, you know, turning to fiction. But diaries and journals leave you feeling a little bit vulnerable, and so maybe I turned to fiction as a way of, you know, <laughs> hiding the truth, but also telling a deeper kind of truth, I think. So, yeah. In Happiness Like Water, uh, you divide two country settings, uh, both Nigeria mm -hmm. and America. Um, how are you actually exploring both within your writings? Well, um, my writing is usually about the everyday life, I think. So I'm inspired by all things domestic, the local, what's going on in individual lives, and and in writing the collection, the stories in the collection, I, I wasn't trying to actually make any grand statements about nation states. I was just writing stories that mattered to me. I was trying to figure out, you know, issues, things that bothered me. You know, I was exploring things in my, in my imagination, figuring out possible solutions for things, 
sometimes no solutions at all were possible, you know, but I just wrote them out. Um, I write a lot about marriages. Um, my mother was in a very abusive marriage, and so I think that was something really heavy on my mind when I was writing the collection. And so that came out as well. But um, I think I just wrote about issues that matter to me in the end. And you know, any grand statements made themselves, really. I wasn't actually trying to make those statements. Can you talk to us a bit about the Nigerian literary scene and about the uh, literary scene amongst the Nigerian diaspora? And where do you actually fit in both of these literary worlds? Well, there are people like Chimamanda Adichie, Tejuku, uh, recently Taya Selassie, mm -hmm. um, Sefiata, Chika Onigwe, there are many Nigerian writers who share this Nigerian-USA connection. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, I'm not a spokesperson for the Nigerian <laughs> literary world, neither am I a spokesperson for literature in America, but um, I, it doesn't appear to me, it doesn't seem to me that any of the writers I mentioned, you know, write for any particular like trend or they're not writing to fulfill any, you know, gaps in literature, what, you know, whatever you, you people like to call it. Um, and the other thing about trends anyway is that, you know, it takes a while to write a book. And so <laughs> if you're writing for a trend, chances are the trend would have run its course by the time your book comes out. So that's usually not a good idea. I myself am not a very trendy person, and I'm kind of reclusive actually, and so I wouldn't know what the cool thing is to do. But um, so I just, again, I just write what, what matters to me. I think what these Nigerian authors are doing is that they are writing about urgent things. You know, I think that what people want these days is a sense of something important, something that matters. And I think many of these writers are writing important things and things that matter. I also think that many readers want to read books where they feel they, they have a connection. They can connect with these characters. They can connect with you know, the topics that the writer is writing about. You know, we live in a world with so many you know, means of communication, modes of communication. Technology is just amazing these days. And yet, we have people who don't feel any real connection to to others, and I think literature is a way by which we get this sense of like connection to the rest of humanity. And I think people are reading so that they can, you know, connect. And so, I don't know. My work, where does it fall? I really don't know. I, I you know, I, I'm writing very urgent things, I think, and I think that's important. Major issues. Right, very and I major. think that, you know, that's a good thing. In your works, you explore gender roles, sexual orientation, domestic abuse, and all of these draw headlines, again, both in Nigeria and in America. Do you think that your fiction allows the reader to understand these issues better? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the gift of fiction and that's the gift of literature as a whole is that it allows us to have conversations that might not otherwise be had you know so these days we hear from some people sometimes that oh it's 2015 we don't have gender discrimination anymore we've taken care of that and we don't have you know like women are not getting abused and sometimes you'll hear someone say to you that oh well women abuse men just as much as men abuse women it's not a contest first of all but the, <laughs> the other thing is that if you just look you know on the average the size of a man versus the size of a woman a man will do more damage to a woman than a woman will do to a man in any case that it's not a contest like i said but I think that you know, what literature does is it helps us have these conversations. So even if we have divergent opinions, differences in opinions, we can at least have the conversation. And I, I, I personally see fiction and literature as a gateway 
to sociocultural change. And you know, I think writers have an important job to do, and it's not something to be taken lightly. Yeah. Now, in the um, in your profile um, in Kirkus Review, mm -hmm. uh, it states that happiness like water was originally titled Wahala, mm -hmm. which means trouble in the Nigerian pidgin. But the Western publisher pushed for something that might be more welcoming to Western audiences. What are the implications of this title change, aesthetically and culturally, or do you see any important implications? It depends on what importance people want to attach to it. But I, I mean, I should mention, first of all, that this was my UK editor, and she herself is African. So I think she was just looking out for me. You know, she wanted my work to reach as wide an audience as possible. And so she thought, maybe we can find a better title. Now, when I was a newbie, <laughs> I didn't quite understand, I didn't realize you know, what it meant. And so I think that I'm, as I'm learning more about the industry, I'm learning that there's a lot of give and, give and take. You, know, you have to give a little to get a little. Um, and there's no perfect situation. So really, I just think the editor was looking out for me and was trying to get the work to reach as wide an audience as possible. She was more aware than I was that sometimes people you, you know, will shut out a book because they can't relate to the title or the cover doesn't look good, you know, or doesn't appeal to them. So it's all marketing and, you know, you have to but, but does Wahala take on a different meaning, a different tone, a different context? It could. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think it does the same job that Happiness Like Water does because, you know, there, the content, uh, Happiness Like Water is kind of like a trick. You know, it, the stories are not happy stories. And Wahala just comes right out and says, trouble. But then <laughs> many people will not know, you know, what Wahala means. So then I've created this remove just by having that title. And so maybe it worked out for the best. Thank you. And lastly, can you tell us about um, the novel that you're working on? You and I spoke about this briefly. Can you tell us about the novel that you're currently working on? Mm -hmm. uh, and how does it differ uh, from your short story collection? Well, for one thing, it's a novel, and so that <laughs> means that it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do so far. It was much harder to write than um, the collection of stories. It's the difference between like running a marathon and sprinting, and I've always <laughs> been a sprinter, so this was difficult. Um, but um, it's also different in the, in, in the sense that it is, it's a war story. So it, it's a family drama that starts off in the late 1960s, which is the time period for the Nigeria Biafra Civil War. And so it starts off then and follows the family till like 2014. Being the love story or the war story that it is, it's also a love story. Many war stories are love stories, but what makes it different is that it, I think it, it's an unusual love story. It's not a love story I've ever seen anybody write about, <laughs> not in conjunction with the war anyway. And so, um, yeah, it also tackles the topic of religion more forcefully than I do in my collection. And you know, I, my reasoning behind that was that I wanted to have the discussion of human rights, but you know, many Nigerians are very religious, and so I wanted to have that conversation on their platform of religion to see if it could maybe make a difference. I don't know. You know, I'm yet to find out what the conversations will be. Um, but I wanted to step, you know, into the more into the grounds of religion and see if we could have a conversation about human rights that way. We, we look forward to your new work. Thank you. Um, at this point, we'll have about five minutes uh, for questions. Uh, so if we have quick questions to pose to Tanella. Oh, thank you. I think I beat Mary Jane. <laughs> 
this time for a question. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about, in your short stories, a lot of them have like a shock factor. Um, where does the shock factor come from? And did you intend to write where people don't know where the story is going and all of a sudden there's a the shock factor? No, I did not intend to write it that way. I'm actually sometimes surprised when people say it was surprising because to me, it felt almost inevitable that that was where the story is going. There have been maybe a few people who say, oh, we know what's going there, but then they also say, um, but they didn't expect such and such. And to me, I guess these stories came naturally to me, and so I knew what the ending would be from quite a few of them before I got there, so I guess I wasn't shocked, but it's good that you were, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Additional questions? Kind of a two-part question. Um, one is I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, the sausage being made, as you say, like the writing process what your writing process is like on a given day or week. Um, and number two, um, you mentioned a number of Nigerian writers, and I wondered if, um, if there were any American writers, short story writers, um, that had a particular influence on your sensibility and style. Well, I'll start with the second question, because that's what I remember right now. Um, yeah, many writers have influenced me. Um, I read a lot of, well, I read Shinoachibi, you know. Um, I also read many American writers. I read Marilyn Robinson. I read Jumpa Lahiri, who would be American, but also, you know, Indian, and I think now she's Italian as well. Um, I read Raymond Carver. Alice Munro's short stories are just amazing, phenomenal, so I love her stories. I often tell people that I think that like those characters are Nigerian, many of them. And so, um, yeah, so I've had quite a few people, you know, writers, and very influential. I, I, I learn by reading, and you know, some people say that talent cannot be taught, and I think I agree. But um, I think you can learn a lot of things. I don't think writing a story came natural, naturally to me. I had to actually school myself. And so I learned by reading other people and just studying, you know, and so that's been, that's been good. Yeah. What was the second part of the story? What is your day-to-day -day Oh, my process. process. Oh, okay, so I don't, I used to have a process when I was, a student at Iowa, I used to um, I used to wake up <laughs> really early, like maybe sometimes 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and I would just I'd sleep with my laptop at the foot of my bed, and I would just pick it up and start writing, and I wouldn't stop until I really had to use the bathroom or something, and so that might be like you know four <laughs> hours later, or and you know when you're sitting and you're not moving, you don't actually feel your bladder that much, so like you'd have to stand up <laughs> to like know that you have to go or something, and so I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't feel that I had to go for a very long time, and so I would get a lot of work done, or if I got really hungry or something, then I'd have to get up. So it was a, so I got a lot done that way. Um, I don't have that kind of a thing going on anymore. Now I just write whenever. And even then, I wrote because I felt compelled to write. I don't think you should write by forcing yourself to write. At least that's not how I write. I write when I feel compelled to write. Thank you. From what you've read, there's a certain even though your characters are Nigerian, there's a certain universality of the themes that you select. And now that you're in America, do you think that it's like a blend of Nigerian, American um, experiences that are interwoven in your writing? Yeah, but the world is a small place now, you know, these days. And so I, I, I almost resist saying that it's 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's not the Nigerian experience. It's not even like a blend. It's just like a universal, you know, like these are universal concerns and humans are just human beings at a point, you know, and so, yeah. <laughs> One last question. So I can make, so I, I, you may have mm -hmm. said something about this. Have you thought of, have you considered writing as a form of protest? You know, I mean, various other countries, there are all kinds of social problems, corruption in government. So have you thought about using your pen to write about that? To write about socio-political problems? Oh, I do that already. <laughs> oh, yes, and I will continue. I mean, you can't help, but my writing is very sociopolitically aware, you know, um, in as much as, you know, right now, I, I was just reading Claudia Rankin's Citizen, and there is this Homi Baba quote that says, the state of emergency is also always a state of emergence, right? And so, what I take out of that is that it's a very uplifting thing, even in a state where we feel like the whole world is in crisis right now, right? So I write about the crisis situation of the world. I write about the fact that, you know, horrible things are sort of happening when, you know, Boko Haram is killing people and stealing girls and Horrible things are happening in the U.S. as well, where you know people are running a marathon and the bomb like just explodes. You know, I write about these things, but in a way that hopefully highlights the fact that we need to get somewhere. You, we need to make some changes. You know, it's not just a Nigerian issue. It's not just a U.S. issue. You know, these things are the worldwide issues that plague us. And so to answer your question in a very brief way now is I just say yes, I write about all these things. <laughs> we do have one last question from a fellow writer, so I think it's important to grab this one. Well, congratulations, Janelle. Thank you so and, much. And um, I'm Marita Golden, a writer also, and uh, co-founder and president and executive director of the Hurston Wright Foundation. And for 25 years we've been presenting workshops and national programs that honor the diasporic community of black writers. And we're very pleased that this summer, when we reintroduce our week-long workshop, Chinello will be teaching a fiction workshop, along with Terrence Hayes, who's going to do poetry, Will Haygood, creative nonfiction, and Brianna Clark, fiction. So we're really excited about having Chinello do this workshop in July. and. Um, Anyone who'd like information about our workshops, I'm here. I can add you to our mailing list. And for the lady who asked about process, I'm in the process of reading a wonderful book called The Art of Slow Writing by Louise DeSalvo. And it's 50 very short chapters, two to three pages, about everything, time, creativity, and how we need to honor that writing is a slow, spiritual, wonderful process. Thank you. Again, we thank you, uh, Chanelo. Uh, books will be available, um, Happiness Like Water. The collection is available in the back, and the author will be signing the work. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.